Fresh from the fires of Dragonspire, Hara Wizard is thrust into the underwater world of Celestia. Inspired by the ancient Greek legends of Atlantis, this sixth world in the main story brings with it the promise of unique adventures and unfamiliar enemies. Celestia is, by all accounts, the definitive new world. Better map design, a diverse selection of foes, and ramped up combat. Upon entering this world, it truly does feel as though the game is shedding its childish, preteen years and entering a new, more elevated stage. Crumbling ruins, sunken and waterlogged, mixed with small glimpses at an empire empty and neglected. This place of power, the resting place of one of the Spiral's greatest mysteries, lies in wait, ready to be rediscovered by the player. By what accounts that remain, Celestia was a thriving culture where the arcane integrated itself into every facet of life. Knowledge and advancement were prized above all else. Celestians prided themselves on their achievements, boasting about their learned society, which they believed to be far ahead of its time when compared to those found elsewhere in the rest of the spiral. These astral wizards, as they are so termed, devised three specific schools, star, sun, and moon, that laid the bedrock for their civilization. However, like any fantasy civilization that goes all in on culture and science texts, they neglected to prepare for the coming storm. The secrets of astral magic were closely guarded within the walls of this insular society, yet the inhabitants could not prevent the tales of this incredible power from bleeding out into the wider universe. It was only a matter of time before word of these magics reached scheming ears. The Shadow Queen, Morganth, fell upon the Celestians with insurmountable force, determined to take their sorceries for herself. It was an army unmatched, unlike anything that the world of scholars had seen before. The war lasted decades, battles raging within the streets of the harrowed world. The astral wizard's strength waning as conquest and extermination loomed near. In desperation, the defendants invoked the Storm Titan in the hope that its awesome power would wash away the forces of shadow, but it was not to be. Rather, upon hearing of the plight of the remaining Celestians, he cursed the great city. Down, down to the depths of the ocean, the structures of the once mighty civilization were to be entombed, lost to the spiral forever. As the waves neared, the remaining peoples had time enough to cast a few large domes over their most treasured landmarks before the sea swallowed them both armies eternally buried beneath the tide. Many years later, the sunken city has become a home for a new type of civilization. Aquatic species such as the Crustaceans led by Emperor Pontus, Piscians led by Praetor Mako, and Lothians led by Glauco live together in a tenuous peace. Present too are other minor factions such as a ragtag group of misfortunate pirates led by their living figurehead, Queen Calypso and the surface-dwelling tribe of the Water Moles, led by Chief Make Moa. Stalwart protectors remain as well. Ghosts and ancient technologies determined to shield the Lost City's mysteries until the end. Following the defeat of Malastare and the subduing of the Dragon Titan, we are charged with exploring this ruined world in order to assist a stranded expedition orchestrated by the Marleybonian Spiral Geographic Society. Along the way, we learn of the bygone peoples of Celestia and their affinity with special magics, and come to realize that although the city may have died in the aftermath of the Storm Titan's betrayal, the war most definitely has not. I think it's clear that the writers were not exactly sure how to begin this brand spanking new chapter in the Wizard 101 experience. For instance, consider the previous bill in Malastare. He is given a rather grand entrance by interrupting the player's orientation. You battle his minions in Gollum Tower while learning the basics of magic and a good guy-bad guy bond is established. Yes, it's cheesy and tropey and all those things, but it's this moment that serves as the story's baby steps, a brief and interwoven exposition into the first arc. We know who the baddie is, we know that the baddie hates Wizard City and Ambrose, we know that the baddie now has a grievance against us. The first arc builds upon that original foundation. Contrast that with Celestia in the beginning of the second arc, where Ambrose literally just hands us a spiral key for no apparent reason, and tells us to shove off. 
it isn't until after he has given us the key and encourages us to go that he mentions that there may be a team of stranded Marlebonians broadcasting a distress signal out there good luck. Well, Ambrose, maybe you should have led with that one then. Already, the writing seems to have stumbled at the first hurdle. The player should have motivation. Celestia is remarkably bad at trying to ease the player into the world. Why are we the ones chosen to help the Marlebonians? What is their homeworld's government doing about it? Don't I have studying to do? We can draw distinctions here between previous and following worlds. In all of the first arc worlds, we are attempting to stop Malastare while he hunts for the Croconomicon and the Dragonspire Spiral Key. Now, this isn't a very engaging motivation, and it is not nearly as expanded upon between the worlds as I would have liked, but it at least gives us something to chew upon. Looking forward towards Safaria, we get something more concrete. A group of our fellow peers has gone missing. In that case, there was at least an attempt to manufacture some sort of collegial relationship that would make us care. Celestia has been given no such care, at least none available to current players. In the past, there was originally an introductory quest to Celestia given by Baelstrom, the Storm Professor. In it, the wizard would work to decode a secret message that Ambrose actually mentions in his offhand comment about the stranded Marlebonian expedition, so I'm unsure as to why they left it out. During it, the player first encounters Shadow Weavers and learns about the nefarious entity known as the Shadow Queen. Barring the stupidly ridiculous difficulty of the quest for level 50s at the time, it did offer, in my opinion, necessary exposition for this new arc. We get background on the place we are going to, we get the setup for a world story with the introduction of the stranded expedition, and we get the makings of a mysterious baddie whose lackeys we have bumped into multiple times. That establishes a plausible character and player investment that is both similar and superior to the Malastare tutorial. Yet despite all of this vital information, players that did not complete the quest a decade ago will be unfamiliar with what exactly our connection to the second arc is. Instead, now the player is just told to go to Celestia and save people on the side. Why? Because Ambrose said so. It's such a poor way to frame something that should have had some level of importance. Even in elementary school, teachers emphasize making the first sentence count to hook readers. Celestia fails at this so dramatically. Let's compare the two Celestia openings with each other to further drive home the point. In the current introduction, you are sent to Celestia because Ambrose, for some strange reason, decides to send a student of his to check out a distress call on some hitherto unheard of world. End of exposition. Alternatively, in the retired introduction, you are focused on helping Baelstrom decode a cryptic message that he has received on his ham radio. You go through a series of trials around the spiral, encountering weird bug-like shadow creatures that hint towards some dark leader, while slowly piecing together a translation. Finally, after learning of the message's contents, you fight your way to the top of the Spiral Geographic Society warehouse in Marleybone, uncovering the knowledge of why Celestia was sealed away, as well as crumbs about the obscure character known as the Umbra Queen. Which one sounds like a more deep and engaging preface to the world's narrative? It raises the question, you know, why not just lower the difficulty of the quest and make it available to everyone? Maybe even as a read-only in-game comic or something, but I guess KI is too good for that. As if I'm supposed to believe, our eccentric and vertically challenged professor asking for help gets in the way of some supposedly epic storytelling moments to come. Come on you guys, make the effort. I think what upsets me the most about this is that not even the typical adage that says MMO's plot lines are always terrible and directionless can be used in this context. It is refuted by the previous worlds, the following worlds, and also by the former preamble that has already been written, voiced, and laid out. One might also retort that this is a hallmark of these types of MMOs in general. The heroic protagonist of the story is stripped of all forms of characterization so that they may more resemble a paper husk than a blank slate, a necessary ingredient for this gaming genre to allow any person to slip into the universe and act out their savior fantasies. But I believe this to be an oversimplification of the circumstances. We can illustrate why this is not so with a rather basic thread. Our character is a student. A student wizard perhaps, but a student nonetheless. It is an admittedly slim trait that would have been built upon by starting with a simple assignment from our professor. 
slowly that would snowball into an actual motive, a purpose. Because, as Celestia currently stands in the game, there is none. Not one driven by plot, at least. Oh, and a side note, the Broken Spiral Key that we receive from the retired introductory quest is a completely different design than the one that Ambrose gives us. I don't really have much to say about that other than I thought it was a funny little oversight that I found while looking back through the text. I guess the devs really just did not know what to do with that retired sequence. Okay, I've spent the past five minutes or so talking about what happens before you even step foot into the world, but I promise that this is just such a great emblematic example of what this entire world's plot is like. So we hop into Celestia proper, and about ten feet away from the spiral door we bump into the doomed expedition. We learn about how the Marleybonians believe that they are on the cusp of discovering something big, and that they need a research buddy. Also their leader is missing. The goal becomes somewhat muddled here, as I'm not sure of what the purpose is after arriving in Celestia. Is it to look for expedition members, or is it to plunder the place of all its secrets, as Marlebonians tend to do? Are we an explorer, or a rescuer? Perhaps both? The story seems to answer this question for us in a rather messy way. As we traverse the place assisting crew members, we miraculously come upon the necessary pieces we need to advance and enter the various astral magic sanctums. But anyway, our journey centers foremost around three main hubs, each for a respective school of astral magic. To access said hubs, the player must assemble the three broken portals at base camp, each one leading to a zone dedicated to one of the schools. Firstly, after scuffling with the local Piscians and messing around in the archives, we unlock the main central star dungeon, the Stellarium. Not long after, we head to the main moon dungeon, the Portico, which houses the Lunarium. Don't know why they didn't just call the instance that, but never mind. And finally, we have the Chancel, also alternately called the Solarium for no apparent reason other than to confuse us. While divvying the story into three core sections is something of a carried over tradition from the first arc, I do think that the plot begins to lose steam during the intermediate periods between the three core dungeons. It starts to become hard to understand why exactly you are in a certain place for any other reason other than the devs needing a filler area that doesn't offer much to the overarching narrative. The floating land is the first major example of this. The player is told to go topside with the purpose of getting part of a submersible from the expedition's wreckage. Throughout much of the island, the player can see the giant blimp peeking out over the tree line. The player can run all the way to it and take a selfie with the captain, but no, the plot demands that we get involved helping the local watermole tribe cleanse their favorite water spirit. Tauntingly, during this whole sequence, the player is supposed to skip blithely past the giant wreck of an airship where our main goal obviously lies. What's more, after the game finally lets us talk to the captain, he doesn't even have a proper objective for us. He simply hands over the submersible parts and tells us to go away in a few lines of text. I was honestly dumbfounded when I first heard that. I had completely forgotten that getting the submersible parts was my main purpose for going to the floating land because the Watermole Saga is a story that feels so divorced from what's going on. And I don't necessarily say this narratively, as it is shown that the expedition's crash causes the tribe's woes, but instead with regard to the progression of the player within the game space. The fact that I can just walk up to the wreckage at any time after I arrive breaks my connection to the story and makes the area, a bump on the way to the coming astral dungeon, feel even more akin to padding than it already is. Strangely, we don't even get to see the submersible in action, like the dragon ride from Dragonspire or the little transport cutscenes from Krokotopia or Marleybo. If one were not to look at the map, the precise reason as to why we need the submersible to get to Storm Riven, as opposed to other areas, may not be apparent at all, as it certainly isn't elaborated upon in the main quest dialogue. And this is what I mean by the areas in between the whole three main dungeons set up not quite feeling as cohesive or well thought out as they should have with the narrative that we were handed. I want to feel as if I'm moving logically forward towards the wider goal of the world, not like I'm being led around by a fickle yellow arrow just because. Wouldn't it have been awesome to see the submarine floating between the base camp and Storm Ribbon above us while we were in Storm Ribbon Hall? Kinda like seeing the blimp cars in Mollybone? That would have been a cool touch, but I'm skipping ahead here. 
The Science Center and the Crustacean Empire also suffer greatly from this lack of focus, but I want to pause here at the latter location specifically and address a rather infamous moment for the lore lovers of the game. I would say lore masters, but I'm pretty sure that's like a trigger word for most people in the community. We are told that we have what we need to enter the Solarium portal. The Solarium, not the Chancel, because the Chancel is a stupid name. Instead, the game directs us into an airlock for another hour or two of questing in the Crustacean Empire area, before it lets us into the place that it told us we have to go to. The quest even says it right there! Explore beyond Solarium portal. Am I reading this right? I guess if you're really stretching your literary muscles you can say that an airlock door is a portal of sorts, but I highly doubt that's what the devs had in mind when they created this quest. Maybe that's why they made the quest title a question. Journey to the Solaria? Well, evidently not. We get this lovely piece of expository dialogue from Sir Thurston Plunkett, who apparently wasn't missing and was just chilling out with the crustaceans for a bit, that tries to explain the sudden shift, but surely this muddles things even more. What does it matter where the entrance is? We get to the Solarium through the portal at the base camp, like all the other Astral Dungeons. I guess we get another portal piece in the Barbican? But again, it would take another literary stretch if they were going to equate a key of sorts to an entrance. Do you see what I mean when I say that the puzzle pieces that make up the Celestia storyline just don't fit together very cleanly? It puts me in a somewhat odd position because I like the plots of the individual areas. Well, the Science Center not so much. But I don't enjoy them in the context of the complete Celestia narrative. No, many on their own would have been fine. I thought it was interesting to learn about the Watermole tribe and get to know the various factions within the Crustacean Empire. But I'm failing to see how it contributes to the larger picture that the world is trying to paint. Such places could have been made completely optional with a snap of the fingers and the game would have only improved because of it. Honestly, there is a whole host of weird plot threads running through just the Crustacean Empire alone as the last main questing area, but I'm going to have to set aside my ramblings till the end, waffle. Otherwise this section is going to be even longer than it already is. Also, I only filmed like 20-25 minutes of in-game footage for the nice background, so I'm kind of working on a deadline here. We get our first exposure to Morganth in the penultimate dungeon. After fighting back against all her lackeys and recovering the Son of Celestia artifact, she appears before us. There, she basically calls you a child, mocks Ambrose, and then pieces out as if she's already won. Also, she reads out some edgy poetry she wrote in her freshman English class. There is no, I have what I need now, or my time in this world has ended. After her recital, she just up and leaves. So, did we win? Did she accomplish her goals? Did she uncover the secrets of astral magic? I guess so. But then why didn't she appear in the previous astral dungeons? As Thurston presumes, she would have needed the Son of Celestia from the Solarium to unlock the secrets of sun magic. But if I have it, are there two Sons of Celestia? Is it like a one and done thing where you only have to touch the Son of Celestia once? And what about the other astral artifacts of Star and Moon? They were specifically given to us by their guardians in the previous dungeons. So how would Morganth have gotten her hands on them to learn the other schools? Furthermore, why now? Celestia has been lost beneath the waves for what I assume to be many years at this point. So what about the current situation has caused her to make a move and apparently be successful? So many questions. Yet the world finishes nonetheless, as we the player are hustled over afterward to test our newfound astral magic skills against the avatars of star, moon, and sun, while Celestia chimes its final notes. Finally, in victory, we are sent back to Wizard City to wrap things up. Ironically enough, not to Ambrose to update him on the mission that he gave us, but to Bailstrom of all places. More fuel for my previous rant about the exposition, I suppose. My theory is that the general script suffered from more than a few indecisive changes in direction and rewrites. Celestia was meant to be this first bold step beyond Malastare, so perhaps the team was so focused on improving other affairs within the game that creating something narratively harmonious was sidelined. In the end, I really don't know how to characterize Celestia's plot. It's kind of like when you're listening to a bad presentation and the speaker just starts spouting random word salad or making flailing hand gestures because 
they're struggling to fill time. First it goes one way, then another, and by the end you're just left with this mountain of information dumped on your head, much of which is tedious and arbitrary. As stated previously, when taken separately, the areas are not half bad. However, when woven together, half the areas seem utterly pointless within the context of the wider goal. But even that word is fuzzy. Again, I find myself asking, what is our purpose in Celestia? One could consider the climax to be Morgant's appearance, in which case our purpose was to scout out evil whereabouts. Alternatively, one could point at the epic battles of the final dungeon to being the fulfilling moment of the world, as we complete our duties as a de facto explorer. I personally prefer the latter. It is best, I believe, to consciously ignore all the hastily introduced and quickly dropped intrigue about missing party members and the half-baked Morganth drama, and instead just see Celestia mainly as a pseudo-side world about exploring this one-storied city while picking up shiny new spells along the way. The jump up in difficulty from Dragonspire to Celestia is something that has been somewhat controversial since the beginning. After all, our players are still too low level to be using Waterworks gear, yet the gameplay has already adopted a more fast-paced and threatening way of handling combat. Gone are the days of the First Dark, where the supposed Master of Death Malastare would spam pesky two-pip Fire Elves, Lightning Bats, and the occasional one-pip dark sprites at your teammates, in between weakness spam. And instead of that, we have enemies that blade, trap, and shield rather reliably. They bide their time, building their power for devastating Triton and Firezilla wallops, or smack you right away with a critical kraken, utilizing their increased starting pips. I admit that I've been caught off guard by street mobs in those first few areas more than once, having to trudge all the way back in a walk of shame. Furthermore, their schools are more reflected as well. Balance mobs mainly cast balance spells, myth mobs do the same with myth spells, and so on. No longer do most mobs have their spells restricted to the 1, 2, 3 pip spells of every school. Moreover, this differentiation is reflected within their health as well with ice enemies having much larger health pools than storm enemies of comparable rank. This does come across as slightly gamey when ice mobs start using mutations of storm spells so that they can hit you like a truck and also take a beating, but it never becomes an impossible obstacle to overcome. I enjoy all these changes, it keeps me on my toes and forces me to devote more attention to previously straightforward street fights. At least I know that I'm pressured to be on a timer because otherwise I'm taking a pair of 7 pip stormlords to the face, which will probably mean a reset on my end. Despite me saying that, the attempt to try and align mobs more closely with their school is greatly appreciated. If even the player's health pools are adjusted based on their starting school, why shouldn't the enemies have that done to them as well? Another thing that I must praise are boss cheats. Now, I know that the concept of adding cheats was, and still remains, something of a sore spot for some players, but I think Celestia set up some noble ground rules for their inclusion that I believe should have ideally been followed by all subsequent worlds. 1. Cheating bosses should be used sparingly, around half a dozen per world at most. 2. Cheats should be straightforward and centered around one single theme. Three. Cheating rules should become apparent within or before the first battle. Pushing players to tab out and use the wiki is a failure of game design. In my fantasy world where these guidelines were followed, optional bosses would be allowed to bend these rules somewhat, but for the main questline, adherence would be absolute. Celestia demonstrated that cheating bosses, namely the three main bosses in the Trial of the Spheres, can add an additional dynamic to the game that keeps it fresh and interesting without being too punishing. Bosses gave either hints or outright told the player how to tailor their strategy around their cheats and made them strategize over how they were to proceed. Compare that with many later worlds out there. If you aren't tracking your progress on the wiki, then your chances for failure skyrocket when coming face to face with an unfamiliar cheating boss. How can the player expect to succeed when they don't know the rules? 
Mechanics such as the three Astral Schools and Critical on Block also make their formal debut in Celestia, lest I forget. The former makes quite an impression as everyone races the train up their Sun and Star School spells, pausing briefly to spit on Moon and its polymorphs. And while I won't say that these mechanics have a huge effect on the play experience of this world, at least as compared to my previous points, in later worlds they become more and more vital to augmenting our kids in being in top shape. All in all, I admired the lengths with which Celestia and the second arc's beginning went to spice up the gameplay experience. By now we had gone through some 5 plus worlds where everything was just so samey and repetitive. After the introduction of Celestia, the devs injected some much needed diversity into the combat system, even if it perhaps wasn't as polished as some might have liked. And if you didn't like it, well then that's too bad for you because it's going to be almost exactly the same for the next 5 worlds. I'm sure that you've guessed by now that I'm pretty needy when it comes to story. I enjoy my storytelling, it's the first thing I run around searching for when I play a video game. Nothing quite absorbs me like a piece of intriguing writing, but you'll be forgiven for thinking that the mess that was Celestia made me hate the world. On the contrary, it remains one of my most favorite worlds. Whether or not that says something about the quality of the other worlds, I'll let you be the judge. Although I do think that Celestia's narrative is a hot mess, the overall feel of the world is absolutely excellent. Thus, I want to discuss the so far unrecognized parts of Celestia's design that I liked. Firstly, the music. It's absolutely epic. The general battle theme remains one of my favorite songs in the whole game. It keeps me pumped and excited even though it's like the 20th time I'm facing the same mob for a defeat and collect quest. Fittingly, there is something distinctly Marleybonian about the soundtrack, reflecting the expedition's origins, but it strays enough from that path to make it clear that this is a strange foreign land with its own set of inhabitants. The areas are distinct, with the music reflecting the perky island paradise above the water and the dark and depressing trenches below it. Perhaps most enticing is the finale theme that plays within the trial of the spheres. It truly is a finale remixing bits and bobs from other area's themes to build towards one last hurrah. Other worlds have probably done this before, and by pointing it out, I'm just making myself look like an idiot, but this was the first time that the game's music had gripped me right out of the gate and didn't let me go, and so this is the only time that I really noticed it. The environments are pretty cool too. I like seeing all the ancient lore being on display for us as we move between the pristine areas under domes and the sunken ruins of others. It adds a nice layer of contrast. The floating land too, despite my earlier misgivings about its content, offers an enjoyable break from the dominant blues and purples of carved facades, 
as they are exchanged for tropical greens and browns. This is facilitated by KI's greatly increased focus on location design. In first world arcs, the areas were constructed out of copy-pasted puzzle pieces for streets. Celestia expands upon Grizzleheim's example of creating one-of-a-kind environments that make each area feel unique and special all on their own. A multitude of newly designed character models were added to the game that bring a distinctly updated feel. Special shoutout goes to the Astro School avatars during the final dungeon, Estraeus, Ptolemos, and Mithraea. I love all their models. They look awesome even to this day. Best natural attacks ever by the way. And speaking of the Trial of the Spears, I think that it is probably my favorite dungeon in the entire game. I love the aesthetics of everything at play here. The new Marlebonian models also stuck out to me. The new engineers and their robots are nice additions. Also I like that some are wearing diving gear. It really sells the point that they've been working hard in this underwater city. It's a detail that I found even more striking when you notice that Thurston doesn't wear any diving equipment, despite him being underwater. You know, because he's a frog? Well, at least I thought it was a cool thing to note anyway. There's a disconnect between the expedition members, with some acting like they are in an extremely dire situation and others not. For instance, there is that training point side quest that you get from a Marlebonian in base camp to just go and casually check up on his pet or go get him a sandwich. Meanwhile, 20 meters away, there's some other member acting as if they might not get out alive. Like, come on lady, I can literally see the spiral door from here. I don't know exactly the specifics of using spiral keys, but surely I can at the very least unlock and open the door back to her homeworld if she is so desperate to bounce. I suspect this is yet another symptom of the writing team not having faith in what they were doing, or where they wanted to steer the narrative. I applaud the design team for incorporating Celestian phrases and littering them about the place on walls and paintings. You can translate them, even, using that handy Rosetta Stone-esque tablet that no one unfortunately knows about because it is in the retired intro. What a shame. Weird how, even when I'm not trying to write, everything keeps going back to that rant, isn't it? Anywho, it truly does serve to make this fallen civilization feel like its own culture and the player is just the scavenger peeking at its dusty bones for any leftover goodies. And I mean, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Even buildings IRL are scattered with phrases, truisms, and marketing slogans. The parallels between the Celestians and Crustaceans were also appreciated. Funnily enough, a Celestian tomb specifically calls out the crabs as being foolish. Now all these years later, and a crab empire rules the husk of their homeland. The new overlords even go as far as to label the Piscians and Lothians as savage and lesser tribes. And thus, the cycle continues. Likely this also serves to connect the greater metaphor of the ancient civilizations of Roman Greece. Classical Greece is often attributed as a hotbed for the creation of many still relevant disciplines. Engineering, philosophy, and language advance considerably, so much so that in the days of the Renaissance, more than 1500 years after the fact, its fundamentals were still highly regarded. Yet, by the time of the Roman Republic's meteoric rise, the Greek world already lay in a fractured state. Soon enough, the Greek peninsula itself would fall under Roman control, swiftly followed by most other Hellenistic city-states and strongholds. The player sees something similar play out amongst the Crustacean Empire, a large, powerful, centralized polity that has fallen upon the ramshackle remains of a learned society Perhaps it was from the dusty writings of the Celestians that the Crustaceans came to organize their own society, much like the Romans assimilating aspects of Greek culture and religion into their own way of life, it stands to reason that the more recent crab inhabitants of the ancient city may well have done the same. More blatant Roman references, such as Optios, a title for Roman military officers, and Praetor, a Roman government official, make an appearance. The portico, the entrance to the Lunarium, also has Greco-Roman roots. Astraeus, the star avatar, is literally a minor Greek god of dusk and stars. Ptolemos, the moon avatar, has a name remarkably similar to the ancient Roman astronomer Ptolemy. And you can't tell me that starting a name with a P followed by a T is in any way a coincidence here. Some theorycrafting to know. If we are to continue this metaphor, 
is that the Crustacean Empire is experiencing turmoil between the aforementioned Piscians and Lothians that they were previously allied to. This could correspond with the decline of the Western Roman Empire, as they were frequently forced to ally themselves with volatile barbarian tribes to survive, the Huns led by Attila perhaps being the most famous example. Does this mean that the Crustacean Empire is also on the verge of collapsing? Well, given that they've been outsourcing the security duties to child wizards, it certainly seems that way. Going even further than that, does the Marlebonian's arrival on the scene parallel the advent of modern archaeology, where imperial powers sought rare and prestigious artifacts from weaker nations? In fact, the British Museum, to this day, still contains pieces that the Greek Republic asserts were unlawfully stolen from their temples many years ago. Even if the connection was never intended, or it's not even really there, I still think it's a fun thing to speculate about. Another theme perhaps boiling under the surface is that of the horrors of war. How senseless combat breeds longing for simpler, peaceful, and more happy times. We see this even in how the shadow web forces react to their legacy of bloodshed. Many are disheartened and just wish for this eternal suffering to end so that they may move on. To close, Celestia was meant to be a huge leap in the Wizard 101 gaming experience and, on many avenues, it succeeds. The gameplay is more intense and engaging, the areas are detailed and nicely realized, and the incorporation of its space and historical themes feels earnest and well thought out. If only I actually knew what my character was doing in Celestia, it would have been even better. Does anyone remember the hype around Celestia? Like, it was just insane with all the promotions and the little teasers they had going out. I don't know, I'll probably throw some images up on the screen or something. But, yeah, it was just an amazing time, it felt like, to be a fan. And I don't really think that they've captured that sort of essence of what, it, of what the community feels like and all the theorizing and everything that goes into making a new world sense. Why did cheating bosses after Celestia becomes so trash. Definitely once you get into later worlds like Chrysalis, they just give you cheats and you, I don't understand how the player is supposed to understand how to deal with them since there's not like a guide or anything. Like I personally use the wiki and while I'm questing to look up bosses if they're cheating bosses or whatever and I can't imagine questing without the wiki because it just feels so unfair like how would i have ever understood what a boss's cheats are um without that resource i don't know just more me harping on about how i feel as though celestia did cheats right as compared to later dungeons or worlds i guess i should say i'm genuinely curious as to why morganth in the story comes back right now so, apparently the war between her forces and the Celestians had been waging for millennia, I think is a term that's brought up. It might be millennia, I don't know. But it's been waging for a long time. So what about the current situation has made her able to achieve her goals, question mark? Because like I, I stated earlier, like we don't even get that if... I, I guess that she does, but we never see that, so I don't know. I, I, I just don't feel like the storyline was in any way set up correctly. It just feels like Morganth is just thrown in at the second to last dungeon just because. With no setup, no nothing, don't get really anything out of that. And I feel as though they could have weaved this in pretty simply by saying that like, the Marlebonians disturbed something and that reawakened her or because we don't really get any information about like okay so the war's been going on for a long time so what has she been doing just chilling out playing with her spider collection or something i would really like it if someone at ki 
one of the devs, whatever, to try and explain how time works in this universe. Because although characters seem to age, they are thousands and thousands of years old. So, like, what sort of mechanics are we working by in this universe? Because as we know, like, Earth is a part of this universe. So, are we saying, like, time flows differently in the spiral? Or, like, what's going on here? You know, the more I think about it, the more I believe that Celestia is the Hoenn of this game. Way too much water and lots of really loud, grand horns in the soundtrack. And in addition to time, how exactly do spiral keys work? So can only the person that owns the spiral key go to the world that it's assigned for? How do people get spiral keys? Are they mass produced in a factory somewhere? How are they created? Like, what if they're destroyed? Is is that world just blocked off forever? If their Bailstrom says that he's going to repair a spiral key, but how, what's the process of that look like? Could worlds become isolated if no one had the correct key? That could be a cool idea for a world, couldn't it? Like an isolated world where nobody has spiral keys to it. Sort of like a Maybe like a Tokugawa Japan type society where anybody that left is automatically deemed a traitor and persecuted and the society itself is just completely isolated from the spiral. I don't know, I'm just spitballing here. Why on earth does the Storm Ribbon not have teleport stones to get around? Like you're running back and forth between two main areas and it takes a hot minute to travel that distance. That would be a nice quality of life improvement to add. Morgan as a villain is just peak hot topic, isn't she? Well, like I said at the beginning, uh, the game officially with Celestia is leaving its childish phase and entering its angsty, edgy teen phase. And I'm not sure if that's an improvement or not. I'm not really sure where else to put this, but this is one of my favorite lines in the entire game just because of the sass. The crustaceans broke the dome, and I'm struggling to find a means of repairing it. We kept a supply of sealant on hand, but they seem to have taken it. Can you go and see if you can recover the bottles of sealant from the crustacean pincers who took them from us? Four bottles will do it, I should think. Hmm. I thought you were getting four bottles of sealant from the crustacean pincers who took them. Was I mistaken? What a boss. Is anyone else curious as to how the Marlebonians got to places like the District of the Stars or the Storm Riven if I was the one that created the means to get there? Like the portals and the submarine? So can like dogs teleport in this universe or something? And it's not just a, oh, they must have followed behind me thing. Like they have a whole camp set up and everything when we get there. Whatever. Moving on. 